you remember our context, uh, Peter and John had gone to the temple in the previous couple of chapters and they had healed a man who was lame from birth and of course a big crowd gathered and therefore they, uh, they preached the gospel. The religious leaders didn't like this. They arrested them, put them in jail, interrogated them. They told them to stop preaching about Jesus. Uh, they said, that's not going to happen. We're going to keep on preaching. And then they released them. Uh, in today's passage, we see that they uh, blatantly disobey their, the religious leaders, as they said they would. And they continue preaching. And they continue doing miracles. Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 12. It says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. <clears throat> so we have all the apostles together, not just Peter and John now, but all twelve of the apostles together in Solomon's porch. And they're preaching and doing miracles. And this is... Solomon's porch is in the temple grounds. Okay, this, is, this area is run by the Sadducees, by the high priests, and the apostles are right there, still preaching the gospel when they've been told not to. Okay, verse 13, it says, Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. Uh, this is a very controversial verse because people are trying to figure out who is being talked about here. Who is this? the rest that it's talking about? Uh, my position is not the most common position. I think the rest that it's talking about here are other Christians who are not joining themselves to the apostles. Not in the sense that they're not claiming to be Christians, but they're not going into the temple, into Solomon's porch, and joining with the preaching right there. It's one thing to tell the gospel to your neighbor, it's another thing to go into the lion's den, so to speak, like the disciples were doing, and preaching. And so they were afraid to do that, but it says the people, it's just people in general, the Jews who were listening, esteemed them highly. The people could see the miracles, they could hear the preaching, and they acknowledged that these people were men of God. Now, therefore, verse 14 says, And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So the church is just growing more and more. Back in chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, we read that there were 3,000 people. In chapter 4, we read that it had grown to 5,000 men, not to mention women and children. Now, and from this point on, no more numbers are given. We've lost all count. The church is growing greatly. And many men and women are joining the church. Now, verse 15 says, So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. So people are recognizing that there is power in the apostles, power in Peter. They're taking out into the streets their sick people, laying them down so that as Peter is going by, his shadow might fall on them and heal them. Now I know there are a lot of people who uh, see this and they, they, there are some people who point out and they say, well, it doesn't say that they were healed. Maybe this is just a bunch of superstitious people. Maybe there's some truth to that, but I have no problem with them actually being healed. It reminds me of Jesus who was walking through the crowd and there was this lady who was sick for 12 years and she was like, maybe if I can just touch his clothes, I'll get better. And she did. She touched his clothes and, he, and she got better. So, I got no problem if God is healing people through Peter's shadow, even. Verse 16 says, Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities of Jerusalem. This is important for the flow of the book of Acts, because we've started in Jerusalem, now the gospel is starting to spread in the surrounding cities. Up until this point, it's only been in Jerusalem. Now it's starting to spread, slowly, slowly. So people are hearing and coming 
into Jerusalem uh, to be healed. And it says uh, they were bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And they were all healed. Here, this is not a main point in my sermon, but here I, I want to make a small side note. Luke, who wrote this, who was a doctor, by the way, he makes a distinction between those who are sick and those who have unclean spirits. The reason I'm pointing that out is because you often have uh, people who go to extremes. You have people who are not religious at all, who don't believe in anything spiritual, and they say there's no such thing as angels, there's no such thing as demons, and ah, oh, these uh, early Christians, they're primitive, they're uneducated, they don't know what they're talking about, so you have people who are probably mentally ill or something like that, and these dumb Christians think that, it's, that they're demon-possessed. On the other hand, you have people who are very religious and they see demons everywhere. Every time someone gets sick, or every time there's a problem, they say, oh, it's a demon that's doing it. No. Luke, who is, first of all, he's not uneducated, he's not dumb, he's highly educated, and he's a Christian, and he understands that in some cases, some people have evil spirits, in some cases, some people are just sick. They're just sick. It happens. We live in a fallen world and that's what happens. People get sick. So I just wanted to make that quick side note because Luke always does that. When we were in the Gospel of Luke and we were going through it, he would do that again. When Jesus was healing people, he'd say, some of them were demon-possessed, some of them were sick. It's not the same thing. Okay. So, having said that, these first five verses from verse 12 to verse 16, they're, they're, they're a summary, just a quick summary that Luke is giving us about how Christianity is growing and how the apostles are preaching and doing miracles. Now we get into the main text, the main story that he's trying to get to. Because of all this preaching and the miracles, the religious leaders get very upset. Again, obviously. So, look at verse 17. It says, Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with them, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. Previously we read about Peter and John, two apostles being arrested and put in jail. Now all twelve are arrested and put in jail. Now they haven't done any crime, but like we've said so many times, this is the work of Satan. His work is to silence the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. So if we can put them in jail and stop them, it's good enough. This is what happens. Verse 19. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. Stop right there. So you have the disciples in the middle of the night, locked up in jail. An angel comes. The guards don't see the angel. The apostles see the angel. The guards don't see them. He unlocks the door, gets them out locks the door again <laughs> on his way out takes them out the, the guards don't see anything and the angel says to them go now he doesn't say go and run for your lives go and hide so they can't find you he says go back back into the temple <laughs> I find this amusing back into the temple grounds which are run by the high priests and keep on preaching this is a, a wonderful picture that Luke is showing us that men cannot destroy God's plans. If God wants them to preach the gospel in the temple, they're going to preach the gospel in the temple. It's going to happen. It's not, nothing men can do about it. And I love the words, I love the words of the angel where he says, go and preach all the words of this life. What life? This life that Christ gives. This eternal life. Spiritual life. Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, talks about those who 
Anyone who does not believe in Christ is spiritually dead. And we get this life through the Spirit of God in connection to faith in Christ. Now, before, I, before we move on the text, there's an important point I've got to make. This miraculous escape is not common. It doesn't happen all the time. In fact, most of the time, God doesn't rescue people like this. That's why this is a miracle. This is something extraordinary. In two chapters from now, when Stephen is arrested by these same people, where's the angel then? Doesn't show up. Stephen gets stoned. For the past 2,000 years, Christians have been thrown into jail, and no angel came and got them out. They died. Sometimes, God will miraculously save someone, rescue someone from a very difficult situation so that they can go on and continue doing the work of ministry. Sometimes God will allow His saints to die and bring glory to Him that way. There is no pattern. There is no uh, model of some standard and we're going to say this is how it is. This is what's going to happen. We don't know. God, in His wisdom, with His perfect will and His perfect purposes, works all things ultimately for His glory and for the good of His people. Sometimes He will re rescue miraculously. Sometimes He won't. Sometimes He will heal. Sometimes He will not. Sometimes He will save. Sometimes He will let you die. Here, He gets them out. But I'm just pointing that out. Don't assume that, oh, a miracle happened, so that's always going to happen. It might, but it might not. This is a special situation. So back to the text. The disciples, it's early in the morning. Early in the morning, the temple opened, I don't know what time it opened, really early in the morning, at dawn. And the disciples are, are out preaching the gospel. The leaders don't know what's happened. That's, that's kind of funny now. Their leaders don't know what's happened. They think they're still in jail. Where else would they be? So in the middle of verse 21, it says, But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So this is a big official deal. The entire Sanhedrin has gathered together 71 men. They sit down their official clothes and they say bring in the prisoners so we can interrogate them verse 22 but when the officers came and did not find them in the prison they returned and reported saying indeed we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors but when we opened them we found no one inside Verse 24 says, Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. They have no idea what's going on. They lost. Uh, we put them in the prison. We put guards there. It kind of reminds me of another situation where we put a dead body in the tomb and we put guards. And then the next morning there was no one there. But moving on. Verse 25. So, so one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. So, the apostles get arrested again, second time in two days, but the officers who go get them, they're very careful how they're going to do it. Because the people are acknowledging that the, that the apostles are men of God. They're, preaching, they're doing miracles. And so the officers don't want to go and rough them, up too, uh, rough them up too much. The officers are afraid of getting stoned by the people. So they go and they peacefully take them in. Verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying... Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. <laughs> I always laugh at that last part. 
Now notice, did you notice they don't ask, how did you get out of jail? That would be the first question that I would ask. How did you get out of jail? But I think, I can't prove this, I think that they know that any answer that they get will not be satisfactory. They know that whatever they hear is just going to get them more upset and they, they're like, just leave. What are you going to say? An angel got us out? Sadducees don't even believe in angels. So, yeah, we're not even going to go there. Never mind. We don't care how you got out. We don't want to know. But we told you not to preach. And here you are, in the temple. And you're, you're telling everyone. And you are... This is my favorite part. You intend to bring this man's blood on us. Well, yeah. I mean, weren't you the ones that arrested him and beat him up and gave him to Pilate to be crucified? Weren't you the ones that when Pilate w washed his hands and said, I am clean of this man's blood, you yelled, let his blood be on us and on our children. Uh, so, yeah. You're right that we intend to bring this man's blood upon you. You're the ones that killed him. It's an amazing thing. And the more, the more we read, the more amazed I am. It, this is truly amazing. At how blind these people are. I mean, it's, it's starting to get ridiculous. It really is. It's, start, it's, it's almost comical if it wasn't so tragic. In John chapter 11, uh, Jesus healed Lazarus who was dead for four days. And what do, the, what do the high priest and the rest of the religious leaders say? Instead of saying, wow, Jesus is obviously the Messiah, they say, man, if Jesus continues like this, everyone's going to believe in him. Let's have him killed. In Matthew 28, uh, when they, they put Jesus in the tomb, and they put soldiers to guard it, and then an angel comes down, moves the stone, Jesus is resurrected, the soldiers freak out, go back to them, and they tell them what happened. They say, don't tell anyone that an angel came down and moved the stone. Don't tell anyone that Jesus was resurrected. We'll give you some money and you go tell people that the disciples stole the body. Just a few chapters ago, in chapter, was it uh, chapter 4? The previous chapter. Um, they want to kill Peter and John because they're preaching about Jesus. But why don't they? It says, because the man who had been healed was standing right there and there was nothing they could say. Again, now, they put them in jail, lock them up, and they're out. You would think that someone would say, guys, for crying out loud, let's just stop this ridiculous fighting. Jesus is obviously the Messiah. Let's stop fighting against the apostles. Let's believe in Jesus. Let's join the church and just get this over and done with. You would think. But that is not going to happen. They will not believe. They don't confuse us with the facts. We've already made up our minds. And, and this is very dangerous because if you remember Jesus, while he was preaching to certain cities in Israel, he condemned them and he said, on the day of judgment, listen to these words, speaking to cities in Israel, and he said, on the day of judgment, it's going to be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. Why? Because if the miracles that were done here were done in, in Sodom, they would have repented. And they would have believed. You've seen all these things. You've heard this great preaching. You've had all this light. And you still don't believe. The more truth you reject, the more accountable you are. The more truth re you reject, the more you will be punished. Can you imagine being Caiaphas? or Annas when they die and stand before Jesus again and again and again and again and they just reject it the clear evidence so they say we told you not to preach in verse 29 it says but Peter and the other apostles answered and said we ought to obey God rather than men Peter says, I, I already told you once, maybe you didn't hear me the first time, I'll tell you again. We're not listening to you. We're obeying God rather than men. You're telling us not to preach the gospel. That's what we're here for. When Jesus ascended to heaven, 
He could have taken us with us, but he didn't do that. Why? He left us here to preach the gospel. We have a message to give the world. We have a message that you don't have to die in your sins. If you repent of your sins, Christ came and died in your place as your substitute, paying for your sins so that you can be forgiven and believe in him and you will be saved. This is good news. God told us to preach it. We have a message to preach and we're going to do it. So stop telling us not to preach. These are the people who are captive. These are the people who are prisoners. They're like, stop telling us what to preach. We're not going to stop. Stop telling us not to preach. We're not going to stop. Verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. If you have been with us through the study of Acts, this is just the same message that has been given. Same message he gave in Pentecost in chapter 2. Same same message he gave in chapter 3 to the crowd. Same thing he said to them when they were arrested in chapter 4. Jesus is the Messiah. You had him killed. God raised him from the dead. But he grants repentance and forgiveness. That's the message. Again and again and again and again. Now what happens? On Pentecost when he had preached the same thing, the people said, well what should we do? And they repented. What do these people do? Verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Uh, the word there, furious, that's not a direct translation. It doesn't actually say that they got furious. It's a very strange word, so no one really knows how to, how to uh, translate it. The word is the aprio. You're like, what on earth does the, the aprio mean? The aprio means, literally, literally, to saw something in half. To, to, to tear something apart. You're like, what does this mean? I, it, <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't say that they got upset, but what Peter said was so intense, was so uh, extreme, so shocking to these people that it tore them apart. They couldn't handle it. And so they wanted to kill them. This word is used only once more in the entire New Testament and that's in chapter 7 when they are torn apart by what Stephen says to them and they kill him. So when it says they wanted to kill them, they wanted, yeah, they wanted to kill them, this is not some uh, exaggeration, this is not one of those, oh I'm so angry I could kill someone, no. They are really thinking about killing them. These are murderers. These people have already murdered Jesus and they're going to murder again. So the situation is very intense. Picture them saying, we told you not to preach. And they're like, we're going to preach anyway. And they're upset and they're ready to kill him. So verse 34. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel... Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. So you have the apostles in the Sanhedrin. They're fighting against one another. We told you not to preach. We're going to preach anyway. We're going to kill you. Gamaliel stands up and he says, Everyone just stop. Calm down. Take the apostles. Put them out. You, calm down. We need to talk. Who is Gamaliel? It says he is a teacher of the law. Gamaliel is actually very famous. Uh, in the fir in first century Judaism, you can read about him in a number of places outside of the Bible. Very respected, very well known. Um, the Apostle Paul was bef before the Apostle Paul became a Christian. He was a student of Gamaliel, and so Gamaliel says, "Okay, says, okay, everyone, calm down. We need to think about this." Okay, Gamaliel, what do you suggest? This is what he has to say. Verse 36. He says, For some time ago, Thudas rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. 
He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered, and it came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men, and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with them, it says. Stop right there. So what is he suggesting? He's saying, he brings two stories of two men who began some kind of, like Judas, Judas of Galilee and Thutis, who began some kind of uh, insurrection, some kind of revolution, gathered some people behind them, but it failed. It didn't work out. Okay, what's his point? He's saying, let these people go. If it's of God, you can't stop it anyway. If it's not of God, like with Thutis and Judas of Galilee, it'll fail. So just leave it. Just leave it. Now the Sanhedrin thinks this is a good idea. They all agree. And there are a lot of people who say, man, Gamaliel was a wise man. Let me suggest something to you that this was a terrible idea. And let me tell you why. Now, let me put a little asterisk here. It's true that in one sense what he said was correct. In one sense. It's true that ultimately, if something is of God, it cannot fail. And if something is not of God, it will fail. Ultimately, at the end of the world, when Christ returns, and there's a new heaven, and a new earth, and everything that is of God's will remain, everything that is not of God's will be destroyed. Yes, that's true. But that's not what Gamaliel is talking about. He's not talking about what's going to happen at the end of the world. He's saying, he's thinking short term. He's saying, well, let's just wait and see what happens. And by seeing what's going to happen, then we'll determine whether this is of God or not. Like with Thutis and Judas. We, how long were they around for? A few weeks, a few months, a few years. They were not of God. It didn't work out. It failed. There you go. He says, let's just wait and see if these people are of God or not. If it succeeds, it's from God. If it fails, it means that it's not of God. Well, here's my question. How long do we wait? How long are we supposed to wait to figure this out? Do you know how long Islam has been in the world? 1400 years. Now I guarantee you that Islam is not from God. If we went in the 7th century when Muhammad began Islam, and we said, well let's just wait and see. If it, if it grows and it succeeds, well then it's from God. If it's not of God, it will fail. Really, it's been going for 1400 years, and it's growing. It's one of the biggest religions in the world. And it's not of God. Just because something is successful by human standards, that doesn't mean that it is of God. It doesn't mean that it will just fail automatically if it's not of God. People are sinners. They, they welcome things that are not true. Greece is 95%, over 95% Greek Orthodox. Does that mean that Greek Orthodoxy is of God? Hey, it's very popular. If you go to... Uh, Haiti. If you go to Haiti, one of, the main, one of the most popular religions is voodoo. So what? Voodoo is of God because it's very popular. It's very successful there. That is not how we determine truth. We do not determine truth about how successful it is by human standards and how much it grows. Uh, there are people who choose churches like this. There are people who will move to a new city or a new country or whatever, and they'll be like, well, let's go find which the biggest church is, because if, the, if it's the biggest church, that means that God is blessing them, and they ha that it has to be of God, not necessarily. Now, I'm not against big churches. It may be a big church, and it may be blessed of God. The church in Jerusalem was big, and it was blessed of God, but that doesn't prove anything, just because it's popular. Gamaliel, I think... I think this is not a good idea. Gamaliel was a teacher of the law. This is how we determine truth. What he should have said was, let's examine the scriptures and see if this is true. Let's examine the prophecies. Does Jesus fulfill them? 
Does the church fulfill them? Let's look at the miracles. Let's look at the resurrection of Jesus. Let's look at what they're preaching. Is it in accordance with the scriptures? This is how we determine whether it's true or not. We don't just wait and see how popular it gets. That is not how we determine it. And, and the, the problem with this is, he's avoiding the evidence. He is, he's saying, he, it's like he's saying, well, we can't know. We can't know if these people are of God or not, so let's just leave it and see how it works out. What if you die tomorrow? That's not, that is not how we determine truth. That is not how we determine what is of God. The evidence is in. The Bible says salvation, today is the day of salvation. The evidence is in, Jesus is the Messiah. Stop just, stop ignoring it and just leaving it. So, letting you know, I don't agree <laughs> with Gamaliel's point, though it is true in general that that which is of God will last, and that which is not of God will not remain. So, even though Gamaliel's advice is probably not the best advice in the world, yet, it does get the apostles free. <laughs> it does get the apostles, it does keep them from being executed. So, there was some good to it. Verse 40 says, they agreed with them, that's the rest of the Sanhedrin, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. I find it interesting that they beat them because Gamaliel has just said, well, we don't know if they're of God or not and we don't want to be fighting against God. Well, if they are of God, you just beat them so you are still fighting against God. So, every time I try and make sense of evil acts, and sinful acts. I get nowhere. Sin doesn't make any sense. So They tell them not to speak again. And they add the beating to that. Uh, notice how as we're going through the book of Acts. Slowly but steadily in small steps the persecution is increasing. This is the first time that they're getting beaten. Uh, we don't know how they were beaten. It's possible that they got the 39 lashes. Uh, the Jews uh, had this uh, special uh, punishment for people who were disobedient and they would whip them 39 times. I don't know if that's what happened here. It's very possible. But why do they beat them? They beat them with the hope that this will shut them up. That this will scare them. Well, what happens? Let's read the last two verses. Verse 41 says, so they, that's the apostles, departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. Not only are they not intimidated or scared by what happened to them? They rejoice. But they say, this is what happens basically. They're saying, Jesus suffered for us. And it is an honor for us to suffer for him. Think about that. And the last verse says that they don't stop. They have been told to stop a number of times. They have been put in jail a number of times. They have been beaten. And they do not stop. Because as Gamaliel pointed out, <laughs> if it is of God, you cannot stop it. And indeed, they couldn't stop it. They just kept on going and saying, Jesus is the Messiah. I pray for us that we would be like these men. And that we would not be intimidated. And no matter what happens, we would continue preaching the truth, no matter what, that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's pray.